Hi, my name is Mikhail Grishovich. I direct the Schwartz Communication Institute at Baruch College, which is part of the City University of New York system, CUNY. And uh, for the last several months, I've been playing around with, uh, with a technology that uh, was new to me, um, but it's been around for a while. And uh, we're starting to figure out ways in which we can uh, use this to engage our students. So the, 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 um, let me just kind of give you the sense of, of what we're going to do, and then, and then we'll get moving. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, webcasting via, via, the, uh, via Icecast, uh, live broadcasting as well as, as, as programmed um, radio uh, uh, programs. And uh, then we'll uh, talk a little bit about the implications for teaching and learning, and then give you a sense of how, how it's done, the technology behind it, and, uh, and play around with some of the ideas uh, that this has, has uh, gotten us to, 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 to play around with. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so what we figure we do is just kind of give you guys a, an introduction and then engage you in a conversation about it uh, in, in a little while. We want to make sure that we have time to, to talk. So, um, so what is DS106 Radio? DS106 Radio uh, is... I'm not responding to my... Okay. Um, DS106 Radio is um, a community web radio station that uh, got thrown together uh, Essentially, by, by, by chance, uh, it, it was a, a part of uh, a course, whoops, a course called uh, DS-106, uh, which was uh, originally uh, taught by Jim Groom at the University of Mary Washington uh, in, in Virginia. And uh, at one point, uh, Grant Potter, who's here with us, uh, said, how about a radio station? And Jim said, great, let's do it. And next thing you know, we have 20-something uh, contributors uh, broadcasting live from conferences from uh, their, their backyards in Australia, uh, listening to Chikadas, uh from, from Tokyo, all over the place. So we have, we've had broadcasters uh, literally all over the globe. One of the things that, that really strikes me about, about this, the, the, this, uh, this is a, a tweet uh, by um, a teacher in uh, Coquitum uh, uh, outside of Vancouver in British Columbia, uh, named Brian Jackson. Brian Jackson teaches a um, teaches a gifted program, music program, in, uh, there in, in British Columbia. And, uh, and they had their spring, music, spring concert last spring that they were able to stream using this technology uh, to literally listeners all over the world. And this, this captures for me the, 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 the essence of, of the, the pedagogical implications of, 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 of live web radio. Is that with, uh, with a laptop and a microphone, they were able to uh, not only record the concert, there's no plans to record the concert at all at school, and then to broadcast it live. Uh, one of the, 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 the issues around this that, that I find interesting is that, uh, and this is kind of a, 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 a side note, is that the reason that uh, Brian was able to do this was because he was, he was able to experiment with this technology on his school-issued laptop simply because someone two years ago gave him the admin password to his machine. And because he had that, he was able to experiment and play around, and was able to broadcast uh, this concert live, uh, and you know, so much to the, to the joy of students and parents and, and administrators. Uh, so, one of the ways that we've been thinking about using web uh, web radio for teaching and learning, and we talk more about this, is is that what what, what I, I I direct a communication program, and so what we do is we try to get students to imagine themselves as speakers, as writers. As, as writers, right, as, as uh, communicating with an audience and assuming a particular role. And one of the things that, that I noticed playing around with, with the radio is, uh, with, you know, just with a phone, uh, I can come up to someone and say, you're live on the radio. And immediately, uh, their whole sort of demeanor changes, and they, they imagine themselves as, as mass communicating, right, that, that they, they now uh, are playing the role of a radio broadcaster, and they're, they're, they're communicating to an audience. And this is very, very, very powerful. And this is one of the things that we want to play around with, with this technology. And there are other implications as well uh, that, that we'll get into. Um, Jim, do you want to? Well, one of the things, too. Going? Yeah, one of the things that's interesting is, A, this creative right here was designed by a student in DS-106 Radio. Now, one of the things that you have to think about with DS-106 Radio is, this is happening as an experiment as a class is going on. So week two, I throw out a tweet to Brian Lamb, like, you know what, screw Illuminate, screw the whole blackboard empire, what we need is we need something free and open that we can experiment with 
and kind of imagine the way we share in a class, an online class and an open online class differently. Well, within a week, Grant Potter had created an open system for web radio using IceCast that anyone could kind of not only drop files off with using Dropbox, but also as we iterated over the semester, people could actually intervene in the stream and start broadcasting from wherever they were. So you, there's something called NiceCast, something called LadioCast or LadioCast, depending on how you do it, um, something called like WinEd or um, for the PC. You could actually become a DJ from your living room or from your backyard. And it's interesting, like the mobile revolution, right? We say in education, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It didn't really strike me as coming until I realized that someone in Australia had their cell phone and they were in their backyard broadcasting saying, look, listen to the cicadas. You know, it's January in Australia. And it might sound stupid, but it blew my mind. The idea that now field reports and the idea that we can access the wider world through something that every technology has. Now, go beyond that to the next level, right? And you start seeing that we have the ability to not only do it from our cell phones, from our smartphones, but now from a pay phone in North America. So we've been playing around with this, and Greg Potter set this all up, is the idea that you can dial a 188 number in New York City or in Utah and be immediately on the radio station. How trippy is that to kind of re-engineer and rethink old technology in a new way? Stephen Johnson, who wrote uh, the book Where Good Ideas Come From, I saw him recently talk at a, a conference in New York City, and he basically said, you know, this idea, and it's a very good idea, is let's not try to re, kind of rethink the model. Let's not try and reinvent everything from scratch. Someone said it earlier in the session. Let's take old technology and reimagine it, what it's doing. And Grant Pond is amazing in this regard because he's taken an old technology like web radio and reimagined it as a platform for teaching, learning, and sharing that gets us outside of what seems to be the prison house of these presentation programs like Illuminate, Adobe Presenter, etc. So, Grant, I don't know if you have some of that audio. Um, is now in the conference. We're broadcasting live. CS Moses Radio, another text from New York City. This is Grant Potter live from a payphone in the East Village. And uh, passing it out to see if it's coming through. So what I'm doing here is I want to I set this up so that potentially a student wouldn't need to have an $800 device or carry a laptop with them or worry about power or worry about spending money to tell their story. They could go out into their lived environment and use whatever technology is available on the street in order to get their, their uh, word out. Now the interesting thing about this is because we've, we've added some extensions to this you know, telephony system so that students could collaborate. So while I was on the line in the East Village, uh, uh, I'm, I'm giving my tour diary of New York City here. But at one point, so what you heard there is, is Alan was listening to this broadcast of me from a phone. He said, oh, Grant's on the line. He can call into this, this, this branch exchange and start talking with me. So, I mean, in this sense, we're just playing with it. We're experimenting and pushing the, and what we can do with telephony and, and broadcast radio. But what's really interesting is you can imagine that as, you know, give it, put that in the hands of students. Go out to an event. Go out to a protest, go out to, you know, on the weekend and collect audio from your living environment and build a story, you know, uh, it, and build some narrative. So it provides them some very inexpensive technologies to do this. And then uh, using uh, Twitter, using micro, uh, different communication tools outside of that, uh, that audio sphere, students can get feedback right away. Well, one good tip by that, I, I'm from Canada, I have no data plan in the United States. I gotta, I, I'm, while I'm broadcasting, you know, what my travel plans are, Alan calls in and says, oh, if you go up to Washington Square, you can get free Wi-Fi. So not only, <laughs> I'm learning things about my immediate environment just by sort of, you know, calling in. But anyway, that's my spiel on the telephony part and how it could be used 
for students. Yeah, and it's interesting too because with DS 106 Radio, one of the things that it came out of is a class that was experimenting with students creating things. So one of the things that happened when this merged is students started creating, um, I think, kind of interesting things based on a particular aesthetic. For example, we have a student um, in DS 106 at the University of Mary Washington who created, let me just find this real quick, who created a, uh, one of my favorite little bits, and they would actually create bumpers. So check this out. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, how do we get it somewhere? Um, just, yes, listen to this. I know that you're listening. Are you listening? <laughs> Free. Okay, maybe like, well, okay, what is that? The fact that this student is kind of intervening in the culture that we hear on the radio and bringing it into class and producing something, but also producing an aesthetic not only for a class, but for what seems like a community that's emerging. Because many of the people who use DS106 radio had nothing to do with the class. They came in because so much of the class was kind of run through Twitter. We had a hashtag, hash DS106 radio, and people would follow that and get on. So you have 20, 30 DJs, maybe two or three, four of them were part of the class. The rest is just this community that emerged through Twitter. And it's actually making a radio station and programming as it goes. And it's completely freeform. There's no kind of logic to it. It just happens and emerges. Now the question is, and this is kind of, I got this from Brian Lamb, so I hope he speaks on this more, is the idea that, you know, what the LMS, blogging was to the LMS, I think, DS-106 radio or something like it, because the same thing is experimenting now with TV, is to these kind of presentation programs like Illuminate and Adobe Connect, right? They're these open spaces that we can occupy and share in different ways. And so that kind of connection that Brian made is important to me because what we're not doing in places like Illuminate and Adobe Connect and all these other tools is kind of happening out in the open in a space like this. And how could this be a new way for a university or a college to imagine yet another media platform from which to pro broadcast to? What if every class across disciplines integrated audio assignments that were actually real life? That you could program a university radio station or TV station, which is actually regularly programmed by the student as producer, by the student as creating something that we can share. It's a completely different look and a model that universities need to be proactive. You know, we heard some questions about innovation earlier, but it was innovation all in regards to money. This is innovation in regards to teaching and learning. This is innovation that what you do in the class reverberates beyond that, and what we do as public institutions reverberates beyond that. We create things, we build things, we make things so that they can be shared openly and widely. That's why we're publicly funded, I hope. And so this is a broadcast medium and platform through which to do it, right? We don't have them right now. We've been doing it with publishing to some degree using blogging platforms, etc. But what about audio? What about video? Where are we doing that? Well, I think what's happening here is it seems like a lot of fun and okay, great, your little Lady Gaga bumper, but it's something more than that. We get thousands of students programming something that it becomes a regular kind of, I think, resource for not only your community, but potentially beyond that community. Right? We just haven't made that jump, but I think it's ready to be made. So, Well, yeah, maybe just to draw that out a little bit, the thing that's really important to remember about DS106, and we've done a few presentations now at different things, and I feel like there's an essential point that we obviously haven't communicated to people, because I think people think, A, uh, you have, I'm, I'm glad uh, Jim already said, you don't have to be a part of DS106 radio to participate in it. All the codes are available, all the passwords, the password's always DS106, by the way. I mean, it's, a, it's astonishing to me that somebody who doesn't hate Jim's guts, and I do know they exist, <laughs> hasn't just decided to bring the station down out of spite, because it'd be trivially easy to do, and maybe I shouldn't be saying that to this particular crowd. But, uh, but the fact is, yeah, so you got this thing that's completely emerging, but yeah, the message that comes out of this, first of all, you don't have to be part of the DS106 universe, and the wild thing is, is how many of the people that have found their way to this station, 
you know, have just completely unique sensibilities. You know, the dude in New Zealand who puts together playlists of Dr. John while he's cooking in New Zealand, which comes through at like three in the morning if you happen to be up uh, over here. Uh, we, maybe we'll play a little audio of Scarlo from Japan, who's this incredibly slick DJ. Uh, uh, he was actually on the air when they had the major earthquake uh, last year, and, and we'd gotten to know him through the station. And of course, the, the, the really ridiculous thing was an event like that happens, you immediately start to think of your friends and people you know in these places. Are they okay? And we're hearing from them immediately. I don't know if you want to just play just a few sure. seconds of that. <laughs> I was here alone, and stuff was falling from the shelves, uh, making a lot of noise. It started small. We, there's a construction site next door where we live, and I actually thought it was the heavy machinery from the construction. And then I was going to be flippant when I wrote an earthquake. It's like a small earthquake hitting Japan. But then the sucker went on for about 90 seconds, two minutes, and it was really weird. Ever since then, it has just uh, continued to wobble with some very solid aftershocks. Tokyo, as far as I can tell, not hit hard, although I hear emergency sirens in the background. NHK television showed scenes of fire from somewhere in the city of Tokyo. The biggest damage that I've seen on the television reported in northeastern Japan. This gives you a sense of the kind of stuff that happens, and, and we all do this in our lives, and it's amazing, too, when you start to realize that by pushing a button on your phone, and this is even before Grant set up the public phone thing, but just, you know, on your, on your iPhone or your Android phone or whatever, pushing a button that suddenly that moment when you're walking down a street corner and there's a great busker playing a fun song and you realize the feed is open and you can share five minutes of kind of gorilla audio with the people around the world, or you just happen to find yourself in a great conversation. Uh, and you can suddenly, and you think it's interesting, you want to share it with some people. And then suddenly, and then the hit you get where people you've never even met, you know, or maybe old friends, are on Twitter responding to the stuff you're saying. And suddenly this conversation with three people, it seemed kind of intensely meaningful. You're realizing you're sharing maybe only with three or four other people elsewhere, but it's wild. <clears throat> Scott was a really interesting DJ, too, because he brought some professionalism to the station. The other thing that's really important, and I heard these guys talking about this in New York, when the station started, we really didn't know what it was going to be like. We thought it would mostly be pre-recorded stuff, uploaded, and relatively polished. Um, and we were, we were usually pretty hesitant to do live stuff because it seemed scarier and riskier, and just technically maybe a little more complicated. Uh, Scott Lowe was something of a mentor to all of us because he had this professional radio kind of backing, and he had all these tricks and tips, and he was very generous with his expertise and his blogging. So over time, the identity of the station changes so much. But just to circle back to what I started with my initial point where I think people miss the point, first of all, you don't have to be part of DS106 Radio to participate, or DS106 to participate in DS106 Radio. You don't have to like DS106 Radio to take a look at this model and do it for yourself. The tools are out there, and if you look at what Grant's been blogging and others have been blogging, like Luke Walzer, who wrote up these guys when they were in New York, he said, you know, I've been seeing people talking about DS106 Radio. It sounded interesting. I'm all for it in theory, but I didn't want to take part in it because I think they just, it's a punk station, isn't it? <laughs> Which was just like, what? I, I, all of us kind of shook our heads. We realize that obviously because maybe we're doing a certain kind of thing with a certain, you know, we find certain things fun and we're perverse in that way, that maybe it's not welcoming to everybody and everybody's rhythms. But the really important thing to remember is just like blogging, you don't have to come and write on my blog. You don't have to come and write on Jim's blog. You can start your own. Uh, and, and really, the, the framework for doing this stuff on your own, again, as Grant pointed out, this is not new technology. Pretty much these frameworks have been around for more than 10 years. Uh, but it's, incre it's not a defined space. It doesn't tell you that this kind of interaction happens here and this kind of interaction happens here. It happens organically. And, uh, and, and why does it have to be radio? It's, I think once you start thinking in this way, you start seeing opportunities elsewhere. So um, some of the DS106 stuff that's happened around live video, I think, has been really interesting as well. But uh, yeah, so that's, I think that's just one point I really want to come out of this is, you know, I hope you're not just looking at this presentation and seeing a bunch of guys congratulating themselves on how much fun they're having on the radio. Although it's been the most fun I've had on the internet in my life. And it's been really rich and rewarding. The, the point is, the, the, this framework is an in, infinitely extensible and, and rearrangeable to the values and the, and the rhythms that you feel more comfortable with if this isn't your thing. It's very much a replicable model that's very, very inexpensive and very, very easy to do. It doesn't require any kind of real specialized knowledge at all. All the documentation is online, uh, freely available. 
Uh, and we're happy to talk with that. Email is a good time to start uh, to open things up yeah. and take some questions. Yes. Um, you, you, you did say at one point that it really ties into teaching, learning, and sharing. And the sharing is obvious and it's great. It looks, it looks awesome, frankly. Um, and I do see some application with digital stories and things like that. Um, the teaching and the learning, I was kind of curious what kind of course was this housed within mm -hmm. and how did you how did you assess or how did you tie into the teaching and learning of the course? Okay, so this was connected with a course that we teach at Mary Washington. There's an interesting story there called Digital Storytelling. It's a computer science class, 100 level. And the idea of this class is what happened is when DS-106 radio blew up is when we opened up the class and said anyone could take it. And so it was an open class and people started taking it. So 450 people signed up. I'd say about 150 stayed with it regularly over the course of the semester. And what happened is the class kind of while it exploded and it provided this platform. But the students who were in the class, there were 75 registered students and then another 100 and some outside of that. The students who were asked to do a radio show and they were asked to do a series of bumpers to kind of get them into the media because we were already doing audio. The other thing is one of the best digital stories I've ever heard came from a woman who was from Brooklyn, the West Indies from Brooklyn, came down to Fredericksburg, where I am, and did this amazing story. I call her the Edgar Allan Poe of the West Indies, where she eats her daughter's husband. Is that right? Yeah, she eats her daughter's husband, kind of like Poe, like, you know, with a telltale heart, or, you know, two, two bottles of relish was another one. I don't maybe that's not making a point. It's not about eating people. Um, <laughs> what it's about is actually... Not primarily. Not primarily. <laughs> it's about this idea that we integrated this into a curriculum, but as Brian says, the curriculum was one small part of it. The radio actually took on a life of its own, and it was much bigger than the class, but the students got exposure to it. And what really started to interest me is it worked for DS-106 Radio, and that's its own community, but I want to bring this idea of community and radio back to UFW and have it be UFW radio. And so integrate that across all disciplines because it doesn't have to be just a digital storytelling class. It could be an economics class, it could be a geography class, folklore music class. We have faculty who are going to do different assignments in these different disciplines to feed the radio. So you have an hour talking about geography and you know the geographies around the world and they're doing that in a different mode. They're doing that in the mode of audio and producing for audio and sound effects and thinking about the medium differently. And that's where it's cool. Because it doesn't have to be digital storytelling. It's not just one class. It could be across every discipline. I don't care, sciences, math. It's, you can do it all. It's a platform for sharing audio. So whatever assignment you assign can be assessed the way that you typically assess it. This is a platform for, for students to share on the one hand and also to feel like, to enrich the experience that they're, they're communicating with a larger audience. So it becomes very powerful for that. Well, the, the reason I ask my question is because it isn't like an illuminate or something that they're going to drop files in there and you can see what they've done. In a radio station, it seems very difficult to, but there's so much in there. How do you find your students and what they did in there? Oh, it's, it was pretty easy because they blogged the work they did. And so I had a track of everything they did. And uh -huh. Grant set it up that you could have a Dropbox. So in the Dropbox, they called Drop It To Me, all their files, I asked them to name their files in a particular way. And just through file naming, we can find everything. So actually, it was, it was really far more streamlined than Illuminate. And what it was cool is it was ambient. It wasn't like going in and is your JavaScript working, make video. Like, no, it was radio. And as Grant always says, it's in the background. It's what we live and breathe. And for me, I think it was a better open experience for people who don't really care about the course. They just want to hear when Brian came on and talked about mashups. Or when someone like, just wanted to tune in. It was really cool. I sort of put a hand back there. I guess kind of along the same lines, um, if, you're, if you're used to very structured environments like, like Blackboard or Illuminate, um, I guess coming in this can seem very chaotic or very intense. And could you just speak to that a little bit? Like, do you, do you feel like this is chaotic and intense or how, how does that make sense? You, you, think, you think about Illuminate, you, how, many thing, how many times have you gone into Illuminate and said, can you hear me? Is this on? And you're like, boom, 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 boom. You know, you get the video, you got the chat. You have the slides, you have the audio, you've got all these tools. You simply need to listen. You don't have to watch any video, there's no talking head. All you need to do is, just, is be, act, be an active listener. So it's actually that, that process of all those different voices coming in, yeah, it can be a little chaotic because there'll be a little music, and then there'll be a report from a student or from an instructor. Some cases, somebody's at a conference, and they, what they're hearing is great, and they put that, that goes on in, out in the community. So the students 
you know, end up, you know, listening in to the, you know, some conference stuff, or maybe it's just a bunch of instructors and instructional designers. So yeah, that part is chaotic because you get all this audio coming in, but for the participant, as far as a listener, it's really clear. You just have to listen. And as someone who was a guest lecturer in Jim's course, it's it's an interesting exercise when you get used to presentation where, and then suddenly you're asked to share an hour with students and communicate strictly using audio, knowing you don't have those tools. But are you telling me you can't tell a good story with just your voice or just just using your words? I mean, have you seen, listened to a show like This American Life? Have you listened to? Sh I mean, it's an incredibly rich medium. And yeah, if you want people to be able to refer to stuff, I threw together a wiki page that people could go look at and click the links so they could see the stuff I was talking about on their own speed. But actually, the discipline of simplifying that technology and just saying, no, you're, you've got to try to communicate some ideas here. I'm sorry, you, you, you wanted to get in it? Um, yeah, I'm, uh, my name is Elmer Masters. I'm with the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. And we've been running um, a blogging and podcasting network called Classcast since 2005. And uh, that lets uh, law faculty uh, call in on the phone. They can upload and record uh, MP3s and video and stuff. Um, it's, uh, right now it's running on WordPress. And, um, and we've managed to accumulate in that time almost 30,000 hours of lectures <laughs> and course summaries and Q&A sessions and symposium recordings. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, we've been, we've been around. I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, we, and I'm, I'm, you know we're, we're very small and, and you know, I, I run that, I run a, a website that gets used by 10,000 law students a day for other stuff too, and so my, my time gets, gets split up. but. Um, the law faculty from, we've, have, we've had about, uh, well right now I've got about three dozen law faculty, probably about <coughs> half of whom are, are, are using the, the uh, podcasting capabilities in one way or another. Um, and, uh, and they come from schools all over the country because we we're a, a membership uh, organization and um, we have about 200 law schools in the U.S. that, that are members. And so we actually cut across all of the, um, uh, all of whatever they're doing locally to, to give them this space. And I've had law, I've had law faculty now who've been podcasting their classes um, by uh, recording them and uploading them, or calling in uh, uh, daily updates for going on four or five years, like religiously, they've worked it into their uh, thing. And their students love it because law students. Um, will listen to lectures over and over and over and over again, um, you know, just to, to know uh, what the, you know, to be ready for their exams and stuff. So. Yes. How, how much time do we have? Oh, we're, we're, yeah, we're can, I, can I do this? Oh, you can say this. I got a short, like, one paragraph. To make just one more yeah. really quick. So in, in, in response to the question about, you know, whether this is chaotic, it's really, if you, if you run this for, for a class, it, it need not be chaotic. It just, the, the, you can impose structure on how your students use it and, and just the way that, that it figures in, in your curriculum. So, so this is chaotic, but th that does not need to be the case when, when, if, if you were to do this on your own. This is just the way this emerged. But the, the, you can certainly build in the structure. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just to I want to thank uh, everyone here for not bringing up copyright. Because uh, <laughs> frankly, it is a gray area and it's a little unresolved. And when you don't put pro uh, controls on people, you can't really control what they do. Um, for the most part, everyone's been really respectful and nice to one another on the radio, but we, I'm sure there's been some copyright law violations. Anyway, I'm reading this fantastic book right now by a British historian named Adrian Johns. It's called Piracy. It's really a history of intellectual property through the lens of intellectual property piracy. He's talking about the very earliest days of radio in England. And the problem that was posed, because radio was really developed by all these individual hackers out there, and they were these experimenters, but when they started to try to license radio, suddenly this concept of the pirate listener emerged. And just to finish, I just thought this, just remind, I, this to me, I, I couldn't help but think of a grant when I was reading this. Uh, there is no way to tell who was or was not an experimenter, no count how many there were. Or to put it another way, everyone was an experimenter, at least potentially. In that case, radio took on a different role. It might be the trigger that could turn potential into actuality, taking dormant talents and enticing them into use. The listener may perhaps become an experimenter. The experimenter may become an inventor. And that's how this uh, few months has felt to me. So, thanks very much. Thank you. Tomorrow, there's a science fair session on 
this exact thing uh, run my brain and, and grant. So come learn more about it. Yeah.